This is Captain's Log with your host, Captain Mark Gray. Welcome aboard. Your boat went down in the middle of the ocean and you made it to your raft. Learn some statistics and survival secrets from a man who teaches water survival for the Navy. Next. My guest is Craig Fix Givens, HM1, United States Navy. Thank you for coming aboard. Thank you, Mark. Uh, could you give us your job title and description? Yes, uh, Mark, I'm a hospital corpsman first class in the Navy, and I've been in for a little over 11 years now. And primarily, I'm working in aerospace physiology, uh, water survival training, uh, ejection seat training, and, and I'm a cardiopulmonary resuscitation manager for the Point Magoo complex. Um, right now, primarily, I work with water survival training and, uh, and aviation safety. Uh, I understand that you, today you're going to tell us and our viewers about hypothermia and exposure mm -hmm. as the Navy teaches it to their men. Right. Can we get along with that? Well, yeah, we realize that uh, hypothermia is an extremely serious uh, situation in a survival scenario. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, how rapidly you can be overcome by hypothermia when you are in the water uh, prior to getting in your raft or even after you're able to get into your raft. One of the ideas is to get into your raft as, as rapidly as possible uh, to conserve body heat. And as most of us already know, uh, the way you can tell that you are becoming hypothermic, or hypothermic is uh, you begin to shiver and that's your body trying to rewarm itself. Uh, there are a lot of factors uh, concerned uh, with hypothermia. Of course, the water temperature is going to be your primary concern in a survival situation. Water temperature out here uh, off the uh, Ventura coastline, Ventura County coastline, never really exceeds between 65 and 67 degrees and uh, your survivability rate is not really that good uh, in, those, in that situation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, your exposure protection. Uh, you want as much clothing on as possible, maybe even wearing it in layers uh, if you can. Your itinerary is going to indicate what type of, uh, of clothing that you're going to want uh, in a survival situation if, if you were to encounter one, not only the weather conditions, but what the temperature of the water is in the, in the water that you're going to be in. Your physical conditioning is going to, or physical condition uh, at the time of the survival situation is, is going to be very paramount. Uh, if you have a fracture or any type of injury, uh, you're going to have some type of shock. And when your peripheral circulation shuts down or starts to shut down, you're going to become hypothermic a lot faster than you would under normal sit situation. Uh, your body size and uh, body fat is uh, definitely a contributing factor. Uh, fat floats, as we all know. Mm -hmm. It also uh, retains body heat. So a, a larger person would uh, stand more chances of survival than a, than a thin person would. I wouldn't have any problem myself. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll latch on to a, gr <laughs> uh, a girlfriend or something. I'll find something out there definitely. to seal. <laughs> uh, your level of physical activity. The more active you are in the water, the more body heat you're going to lose. The faster you're going to lose your body heat. Uh, you Such also, as swimming, trying to swim the shore. Perhaps. Certainly. Yeah, your, your primary concern is to get up out of the water as rapidly as possible. Uh, you don't want to be out in the water a, a lot, um, but that's a, the situation that you have to look at. Uh, body temperature in response to cold water immersion. Uh, of course, the longer you're in the water, the more rapidly hypothermia is going to set in. If you have no flotation, I'm, I, we all know it's standard that uh, every person on the boat should have a PFD or personal flotation device available. And uh, if you have no flotation, you need to consider a couple of situations. One is to keep your head above the surface of the water, particularly if it's a cold water situation. Uh, you'll want to tread water. Uh, as best you can until you can find something around you that floats and then grab onto that 
and stay above the surface. So perhaps if a man flew, uh, fell overboard, that's what the personal flotation device is, the horseshoe and round items that people see, you throw it immediately so he has something that floats. But um, if you don't have that or if you can't find him, it's nighttime, you might try to throw over a life jacket also. If he didn't have it on, he should have it on. But. Mm -hmm. Any, anything that floats mm -hmm. that you can use as positive buoyancy for a victim, uh, you'd want to get that to them as rapidly as possible. That's correct. If you have flotation, uh, you can do um, one primary uh, uh, thing in res response or res reflection on the cold water situation, and that is to assume the help position or the heat escape lessening posture. Uh, you lose most of your body heat through your head, also your armpits, your abdominal area, and your groin. Uh, what you want to do is protect those areas as best as you can. As you can see in this illustration right here, this is our victim that's in the water. He obviously has some flotation device. But what the person is going to do is cross their legs, bring their knees up, and cross their arms around their armpits. All right, what you're going to do in this situation is uh, conserve some body heat if you're in the water by yourself. If you have several people that have, you're in a capsized boat and you have several people in the area and you are having trouble getting to your boat uh, and you have several people there, you would just want to assume the huddle position, shared body heat, the heavy set person mm -hmm. you would find her, things of that nature. So you would want to look at that too. Uh, keep your head covered as best you can. You lose between 50 to 80 percent of your body heat through your head, depending on the weather conditions. So that's definitely one of the things you have to look at. Uh, Keep out of the water as, as best you can. Respi uh, in reflection of your factors, restrict, restrict your physical activity. Uh, try to refrain from swimming because you're going to lose a body, a lot of body heat that way. Okay. And then, of course, use these different positions and mm -hmm. techniques that we have. So, like, uh, you might want to wear a navy knit cap when you're out there at sure. night. And if you fall over, perhaps it won't come off. <laughs> and I know I've lost some, you know, uh, in that situation. But uh, also your rain gear seems like it would be very good to hold in uh, body heat. Definitely. You know. <laughs> and any way you can conserve body heat. Mm -hmm. uh, to further emphasize what I had talked a little bit earlier on uh, the water conditions, it's pretty standard that we have currents in uh, particular the eastern Pacific area. Uh, you have your northern Pacific warm currents that come down and along the California coastline it's rather cool. And particularly out, particularly out here, since we have a pretty much of a circular uh, current, mm -hmm. the, the temperature has a tendency to stay down Good relatively theory. low. Can we hold this out? That sure. way our camera can catch no up. No problem. So you can see when you're setting up your itinerary how important it is that uh, you prepare yourself in, in every possible way that you can in preparation for a possible survival situation. Mm -hmm. Also, do you have that? Yeah. It's a real good chart here that shows your life expectancy with no exposure suit or equipment whatsoever. And you can pretty much look down through here in your hours of survival time and uh, the water temperature that you're looking at. Being that the water temperature never really exceeds, again, between oh, 60 to 67 degrees in the California coastline, you can come up here and see you've got about two hours a survival time out here without, with no uh, anti-exposure equipment on whatsoever. So that's definitely a factor that you have to take in, into consideration. I know recently we had a young man in a race fall over and his friends made two attempts to pick him up or three attempts and I don't know if they could not find him, lost track of him, you know, because it's very hard to see someone in the water even if you're coming around. But uh, at any rate, he had died. So. Anyways, we'll be back right after this with more. Blending comfort, performance, and value, Catalina Yachts continue a tradition of building outstanding sailboats in every class. Sail the Catalina 30 and experience the successful combination of a modern, efficient hull shape with spacious accommodations that create the perfect balance in a modern racer cruiser. America's largest sailboat manufacturer invites you to call a Catalina yacht dealer in your area today.
back and I understand that you have a survival suit for mm -hmm. cold weather. Could you go into that for us? Sure, Mark. What I have here is uh, an adult anti-exposure suit. If I can go ahead and take it out of the bag here. These can be purchased uh, just about any marine store or uh, chandlery and this is the Imperial anti-exposure wetsuit. You can wear it, uh, or you can fit it to a person up to six, six foot six inches tall. Uh, it's designed for quick don. It's supposed to take about 45 seconds to a minute to put this on. If you're taking on water, if you have this available to you, you would want to get into it as rapidly as possible. Well, to in the water, yourself. because if you're trying to put it on in the water, how long do you think? It, it'd take a little longer. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, very buoyant. Uh, you you wouldn't have a lot of trouble getting it on. Mm -hmm. uh, Will you float in that with that alone? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need any uh, extra flotation device to use this particular piece of survival gear. Uh, you quick don, you put both or one foot in at a time and you zip it all the way up. You'll have approximately 94% of your body that's actually going to be covered up. The other 6% is uh, the eyes that'll be out and a little bit of your nose or bridge of your nose. Uh, when you're using this. It's got some uh, reflective tape, real good reflective tape on it. Uh, of course it's uh, um, designed for, for one person use. It would be very difficult for you to get more than one person in this at, at a time. I notice it has little uh, air vents or something in here. What's that for? Exactly. That, what that does is it allows extra air that's inside of the suit to escape. Mm -hmm. One way valve, it won't let any water in. Uh, once you have the suit on. It's got a whistle, a uh, survival whistle, and in a survival situation a whistle can be heard up to about 500 yards. So this is a, a, just one piece of survival gear that is uh, located on the Imperial wetsuit itself. I see it has these zippers also. What, what is this? Uh Part. There's a, an external inflation bladder that can be put onto the outside of this. Uh, that's what this zipper is, is for. It's not really necessary in a one-person survival situation, mm -hmm. but that is there in case you want to use it. Uh, it's good indefinitely for zero degrees, and uh, it's, it's capable of being used up to 60 degrees below zero. Now, obviously, in an over water situation, you wouldn't have to deal with that type of temperatures, but you can see how effective this mm -hmm. uh, piece of survival gear is. One thing I was wondering too, like uh, personal flotation devices will keep your head out of the water mm -hmm. because sometime you might be exhausted, fall asleep, be unconscious. What, is this designed to keep your head up in any way? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. You can either be on your back floating with a backstroke uh, for getting you from one place to another. For instance, if you took a little nap after a day in the water, <laughs> would, it, would you start to sink? Or? No, you wouldn't. No, mm -hmm. positive buoyancy uh, for one person indefinitely. Um, very good, effective piece of gear you have here. Uh, it has uh, designed that you can use the fingers or use the hands. One of the biggest problems you have with hypothermia is uh, the loss of mus muscular dexterity. and. Uh, you might have all the survival gear in the world available to you, mm -hmm. but uh, if you have a situation where you're getting cold uh, and you go to use any of your survival equipment, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble using your hands. Uh, this Imperial wetsuit has fingers in it and you won't have any trouble at all using mm -hmm. this uh, glove device that you have on I these. also imagine, much like a wetsuit, you probably get a little bit of water in there and that does that work as an insulation for you? Uh, yes, it would, Mark. You have just a little bit of water is capable of getting in just around the eyes. You'd have to have some pretty heavy sea states to get any water into it at all. If you put it on properly, uh, if, if you go or if you have it on before you enter the water, if you're in the water, uh, it would warm up any water that's inside of the suit with you. Mm -hmm. I also notice on the feet, it does have, uh, it does have a non-skid type material mm -hmm. right here. Yes, it does. And that's great for walking on deck if you're wearing this just in case. You know, you're out there sailing and the weather's really bad. But I wonder if uh, this tears, you know, very easily or if it gets caught, if oh, it would tear. It, it's pretty rugged. It's mm -hmm. built with uh, basically the same material that you would find in your, in your wetsuits. Mm -hmm. And you, it'd be pretty difficult to, to mm -hmm. put a hole into it. It's also uh, international orange and it's very visible in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the water and uh, say uh, a rescue helicopter were to come on 
station, all you'd want to do is splash water up on your head or over your head to increase your visibility in the water. Oh, it gives a reflection then by being wet, more reflection? Uh, no, it's just there. what happens when you your splash arms. Of water is it just mm -hmm. gives you a little more visibility out there. Mm -hmm. Rather than just floating still. Yes. Uh -huh. Also have another piece of survival equipment that is available through most of your marine sales stores. Uh, the space blanket. Again, it's international orange. On one side, it's, it's very large. Kind of have some help here getting sure. this open. This is going to be a real good way for you to conserve body heat by using this particular piece of survival equipment. As you can see on one side, you have a signaling panel, and there's some real good instructions on the back side of it how to use it. So you should not just buy it and throw it in a kit, but open it up. Uh, Certainly, by all means. Perhaps even try to open one in the water when you're not in an emergency. Well, in the, so. in the military, we have a tenant or one, an old saying, three flights are here, so yeah. you should always know. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to be back with the space blanket right after this. Marina sailing, experience it, the vacation of a lifetime, islands to explore, sheltered coves to discover, clear water to enjoy. You say you don't know how to sail, well that's okay, because we've been teaching people to sail for over 25 years. In fact, we're California's oldest and largest sailing club with 70 boats and three locations to serve you. Come on down, take the challenge. We're Marina Sailing. Navy survival instructor and our space blanket. Could you tell us about this? Sure, Mark. As you can read, and as there is on almost any survival equipment, uh, directions on how to use it. One of the nice things about the space blanket is if you have it over on the orange side, there's a panel that uh, covers some basic first aid, hand signals, mm -hmm. uh, different ways that you can wrap the space blanket uh, and indicate if you're in need of medical attention, if you're in need of food, uh, if you need water, or what the situation happens to be. So this is an extremely valuable piece of uh, survival uh, gear for uh, anybody that uh, is in the aquatic environment. I understand too, like all these hand signals, an average pleasure boater might not, you know, doesn't have training, just bought a boat and went out, might not understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're pretty safe in assuming that uh, these are internationally known, you know, and the military understands what's going on, the Coast Guard and all that, mm -hmm. right? And right. I would suggest if more private boaters got one of these and studied that, it'd be a good educational supplement. Sure. And along that line, uh, in regards to the, the first aid that, that you see on, on the back here, it's it's very basic. Uh, anybody that's going to be involved with an extended uh, cruise or something of that nature, you might want to suggest that they uh, take a basic first aid course or even CPR training. Uh, it could be really valuable or even uh, some basic water survival skills training that's available. Uh, if you turn this over, we'll signal the airplane. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> This is the side that you would wrap yourself up in, in a survival situation, again, yes, to uh, conserve heat. Always put the silver side towards you, it'll reflect the heat off of you, and also uh, keep the heat that you have available inside. Of course, if someone went by 
would you want to turn it to that side, try to use it to signal somebody? Would it yeah. be advantageous? Almost certainly. Uh, you'll have, you have signal mirrors that are available, uh, you have strobe lights and things of that nature. Uh, if you were to use this panel, say with your strobe light, mm -hmm. uh, you can increase the visibility uh, a lot. Such as a mirror. I remember watching a Thomas Edison movie and uh, there's something about mirrors, they amplify and reflect light. Mm -hmm. So you could do that. Perhaps if you had a strobe, hold your little signaling mirror up to it and get a lot more mileage. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, what do we have next here? Okay, that, that's basically it. Uh, pretty much what you would want to do if, if you're a new boater is to, to be more familiar with things that are available for you to... Uh, Tour the Chandrelays, talk to other boaters, especially, it's, it's like everything, uh, the boating community seems to be a word of mouth community. There's not that much advertising going on to where you talk to people that live on boats in the marinas to find out where's the best marina, the boat yard, the best mechanic, and the best gear. But I find a lot of boaters don't know. Mm -hmm. So therefore you want to take it upon yourself to tour the different Chandrelays, the uh, marine stores and equipment places and go out of your way to look them up and stop in. Sure. What we try to tell our people is to uh, not only pre-flight your equipment, but to know exactly where you're going to be going, uh, what type of gear you need to, to take with you. Talk to some of the more experienced people that uh, have been in the community for a longer period of time. Uh, you're going to increase your chances in a survival situation uh, many times over. And there's nothing better than, uh, than a captain that knows his ship and, and knows everything that he has available to him uh, to, to uh, save yourself in a, in a survival situation. Uh, do you have any little safety tips um, dealing with exposure, hypothermia, or perhaps a little story about something you've seen that might help? you know, save the public boater's life or further educate them? Well, personal experience I had uh, last year, we had some training off the coast out here and I was a safety swimmer. And all I had on it was a shorty and a pair of fins and a mask. And the evolution went for about two hours. And when I was out there, I didn't really feel how much uh, or how cold I was actually getting until I got out of the water and was in the raft and at that point in time, I realized uh, how much of a potential problem that I could have put myself into. Uh, if you have a situation where you have uh, people that are, are panicky and you have to get that person out of the water, uh, there are, are so many of those factors that can come into play. It's better to be safe and treat them for hypothermia. And contrary, I, I think you would agree, contrary to a lot of popular belief, you don't give them hot coffee, you don't give them alcohol, no. you warm the body core slowly. And uh, I believe the methods I've heard about is you have warm lava rocks or something, <laughs> or you use body heat. Uh, could you tell us about that? We have about a minute left. Yeah, you don't want to uh, give stimulants, because uh, most of your stimulants are, are vasoconstrictors, or they slow down the blood flow, they constrict the blood vessels. Uh, and in that situation, you would try to refrain from that. Uh, you want as much blood circulating through the system as you can uh, to rewarm the area uh, as best you can. In a survival situation too, you have what's called trench foot or immersion foot. A lot of people think, well, I get my body temperature back up and I'm okay. But if you have cold, wet shoes and socks on, uh, you're setting yourself up for even further problems later so on. So you want to get dry all and, over your whole and body. And warm up the extremities last, you know, work, work with the, the core of the body. temperature first. Okay, well, we're out of time. I appreciate you coming. I, I'm glad that I could take some of the Navy's knowledge here and put it on tape. Thank you. This has been Captain's Log. Be safe. Thank you.